Hi right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of UK Space News. This week we've got more Juice Progress updates, a rather sombre turn for iSpace's Hakuto R lunar lander, High Impulse moved closer to becoming the first company to launch a rocket from Saxavoid. But first, we start this week with a mighty Falcon Heavy. So stick around and let's get going. All right, uh, lift off and the clock has started. All right, everyone, welcome back. This Sunday saw the latest launch of the world's biggest, for now, commercially viable rocket. Yes, the Falcon Heavy from SpaceX. And this time, there was to be no recovery for any of the boosters. That's right, this was the first fully expendable Falcon Heavy launch where none of the boosters would return to Earth. On Sunday the 30th of April, the Falcon Heavy lifted off at 8.26pm Eastern from NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida towards a geostationary orbit carrying the Americas focused Viasat 3 broadband satellite. This was following delays partly caused by severe weather that included lightning and tornado warnings at the range. We got some amazing shots of those combined 27 Merlin engines blasting the Falcon Heavy skywards with a total thrust of around 5 million pounds. Both side boosters separated from the core stage just over 3 minutes after liftoff. The boosters had previously supported 9 earlier missions in total, however SpaceX decided not to attempt to recover them this time to improve the rocket's performance. You'll also note that they also painted one of the boosters grey to try and make sure that they could keep the fuel at an optimum temperature inside the booster for as long as possible. The primary 6,500 kilogram Viasat 3 Americas payload was deployed around 4 hours and 32 minutes after liftoff, followed by two rideshare payloads, the Arcturus, which is the first broadband satellite built by Astranas, and it weighs around under 400 kilograms, alongside a CubeSat from Gravity Space with a communications payload on board. The next two Falcon Heavy launches are due for later this year when SpaceX will carry the Jupiter 3 Echostar 24 communications satellite and then we have NASA's Psyche asteroid hunting mission. There's no word on when Jupiter 3 Echostar will actually launch as it's been delayed from its original slotted May date and Psyche is due to launch sometime in October. Next, a rather sad end to Japan's Hakuto R lunar landing mission, as I mentioned in last week's video. Built by iSpace with assistance from JAXA, Hakuto R was said to be the first commercial lunar cargo lander after earlier failed attempts by India and Israel to achieve the same thing. When recording last week's video, Hakuto R was only hours from touchdown at Atlas Crater on the northeast side of the moon. Now, for anyone watching the live stream, we saw shots from iSpace's control center as we got nail-bitingly close to these guys pulling off something that no other commercial company has achieved. Interestingly, there was no live onboard camera shots during the stream from the lander, and instead the feed was made up of data streams and a CGI mock-up based on expected results. The clock ticked to zero and the simulation showed Hakuto R as touching down, but the team analysed the data carefully, watching for confirmation from the autonomous craft. As the minutes went by and we were put on hold by the commentary, it became clear that not all was well or as expected. Uh, a wee while later, iSpace's CEO Takeshi Hamada then stood up before his waiting audience to confirm that the team had been unable to achieve communication with the lander and it would now not be possible to complete the remaining objectives. A very eloquent emotional speech in both English and Japanese, but a nice way of saying that Hakuro R had crash landed. In the days that followed, it became apparent that the cause of the hard landing was a loss of fuel earlier than expected, resulting in the lander speeding towards its landing site at the point it should have been slowing down as it was captured by the moon's small gravity. This was possibly due to a failure to employ better use of the onboard radar compared with other observation methods. But I suppose that's speculation at this point, however the data does suggest that the lander was further away from the lunar surface than it was intended to be or that the team thought it was. So yeah, they got to within about a few seconds of the landing itself before they ran out of fuel and it began to speed up and ultimately has crashed into the moon. So yeah, the team will no doubt learn from everything and pick themselves up in preparation for the next mission in 2024 with Hakuro R Mission 2. 
Mission 3 is then due for 2025, so we're hoping for a really good result from them next year. This past week we also had another update from the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, and that mission is mostly proceeding as expected, apart from an issue with the 16 foot RIME antenna. The RIME or Radar for Icy Moons Explorer instrument is an ice penetrating radar designed to study the surface and subsurface structure of Jupiter's icy moons, down to a depth of 9 kilometers. So this is one of the primary instruments on board the spacecraft that makes up the whole of the Jupiter Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer mission. Now, only two thirds of this antenna have been able to be deployed from its storage position, with the last little bit stuck in its mounting bracket. It appears that the cause of this is a small pin which has failed to detach, possibly by only a few millimeters. Teams at Juice HQ in Darmstadt in Germany are working the problem, and their solutions include an engine burn to shake the spacecraft a little, followed by a series of rotations that will turn Juice, warming up the mount and radar, which are currently in the cold shadows facing away from the sun. One positive from Juice though was from the UK built JMAG magnetometer. The JUICE magnetometer boom, or JMAG, was deployed on the 21st of April, when JUICE was about 1.7 million kilometers from Earth. And since then, we've actually had the first scientific data come back from the JMAG, with data actually collected at the moment of deployment itself. The plot on screen shows the magnitude of the magnetic field from two sensors, as indicated by the red and turquoise lines, before and during the deployment. The two sensors are mounted on the outer segment of the boom and separated by only about 3 meters. The labels OBS and IBS indicate the data from the outboard and inboard center sensors respectively, with the OBS mounted close to the end of the 10.5 meter boom. The left side of the plot shows the field trace before the boom deployment, and the plot line changes as the boom deployment occurs, starting at just after 1429 UTC, and taking approximately 2 seconds. Thereafter, the two field magnitudes are at a similar level, trending towards zero and stable, indicating that the boom has fully deployed, and both sensors are measuring the ambient solar wind field. Once the Jupiter system is in sight in 2031, JMAG will help to characterise the planet's magnetic field and its interaction with that of Ganymede, while also studying the subsurface oceans of the icy moons themselves. And finally, work at Saxevoort is heating up again, or maybe it's cooling down, I don't know, as we move closer to the first rocket launch from the complex. Germany's High Impulse Technologies have completed their latest round of engine testing, with completion of the 8th campaign for their Hyplox 75 hybrid rocket motor. This engine is the backbone of High Impulse's two upcoming rockets, the SR-75 suborbital sounding rocket and the SL-1 orbital class small sat launcher. High Impulse are using the SR-75 as a test platform for technologies that will be used on the SL-1, similar to Skyrora's plan with the Skylark L and Skyrora XL setup. Both of High Impulse's rockets are of a hybrid design, meaning they use a combination of solid rocket propellant, in this case paraffin, and liquid oxygen oxidizer. Now, this is actually a really old concept for rocket design based on stuff from the 1930s and has been used successfully in sounding rockets for decades, but at times has struggled to be integrated for use in larger orbital class rockets. The Hyplox 75, as the name suggests, is designed to deliver 75 kilonewtons of thrust and the SR-75 will have one of these motors on board. It's actually the SR-75 that will become the first rocket to be launched from Saxevoord later this year, beating out RFA's orbital class rocket by a few months. The SR-75 is estimated to have an apogee of 150 kilometers and will carry two payloads to test microgravity at a suborbital level. Now, High Impulse are by no means the only company working on this type of design. Hyperspace in the US and Thai Space in Taiwan are just two examples. But the cool thing is, with advances in technology since hybrid motors came to life, is the variance in thrust adjustments with throttling, shutdown and crucially, in-flight reignition, all now becoming viable. Of course, while High Impulse can claim to be the first to launch a rocket from Saxevoort if they're successful, they won't be the first to launch a rocket from UK soil, as 
that little award actually goes all the way back to 1962 with the oft forgotten Bristol Aerojet made skewer sounding rocket. Now this tiny little thing reached an altitude of 80 or so kilometers, while its bigger brother, the Petrel 1, was the first to reach space on the 8th of June 1967 when it launched from South Uist in the Outer Hebrides, reaching an altitude of 140 kilometers, carrying a single scientific payload. So, a little bit of history for you there at the end, but we'll have to wait a little bit longer until we see the first full orbital class rocket launch from UK soil at the back end of this year, or possibly in 2024. I've been Tom June, thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.